afternoon, happy Monday, and thank you so much for taking the time uh, to check out this broadcast, whether it's in the moment or after the fact. My name is Josiah Gilliam, and I'm the My Brother's Keeper Coordinator in Mayor Bill Peduto's Office of Equity, and we've been doing an ongoing series uh, exploring different buckets of city activity and life here in Pittsburgh uh, through the, the people that know this work best and taking special care to explore the intersections at play. And today we have a really cool conversation that I've been really looking forward to um, with a lot of participants, as you can see. Uh, we're gonna talk about sustainability, we're gonna talk about resilience, we're gonna talk about how Pittsburgh thinks about measurement and how Pittsburgh and other cities around the world think about this work. Uh, but there's a really cool local story here that will really um, kind of exemplify what we're talking about. We have some slides uh, to show uh, that'll break down things even further. Uh, and we're just gonna try to have a free flowing conversation uh, about these topics. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the team here. Uh, friends, what I'd like for you to do, uh, your name and your role and how you come to this work. What perspective are you bringing into this conversation? Uh, let's start with the mayor's office. Uh, Ricardo Williams, we'll start with you, man. Hi, my name is Ricardo Williams. I'm the business inclusion manager for the city of Pittsburgh Office of Equity. Um, I guess the, my perspective is, is how do we kind of relate our procurement practices uh, into sustainable goals, into the sustainable goals that we have? Um, and how do we utilize our partners uh, locally to work toward that North Star and, and be able to bring it in? So my role is basically doing the outreach and also connecting different partners um, to our to sustainability, to sustainability goals, and then also leading it up to a VLR, um, which my colleagues will be talking about more in depth. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, Megan. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Stanley. I'm the Executive Director for the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations. Uh, so we are the city's civil rights agency. We investigate complaints of discrimination um, and we also do outreach and education just about human and civil rights. And so a lot of what we're talking about today encompasses those ideas and really all of the sustainable development goals are centered around equity and human rights and how we can be a more equitable world and locally what we can do as the city of Pittsburgh um, to reach those goals for our residents. And so my perspective is that I spent almost a decade as a social worker and I saw a lot of these things on the ground and really the rollout of policies that were well intended but then didn't reach residents in the way that they were supposed to. So my focus and my work and my passion is making sure that the things that we do in the city at local government levels really reaches residents in the way that we intended for them to live their best lives. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, Grant, how about you, man? We got a special treat today. We got the resilience team. We got the sustainability team. Uh, sir, who you are, your role, and what perspective you're bringing to the conversation. Yes, thanks, Josiah. It's good to see everyone. Uh, so my name is Grant, Ar Grant Irvin. I serve as the Chief Resilience Officer and the Assistant Director for the Department of City Planning here at the City of Pittsburgh. Uh, in that role, I oversee the Division of Sustainability and Resilience, where we intersect these aspects of community and decision support with sustainability and resilience. Thank you so much. Uh, Rebecca? Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca Kiernan. I'm a principal resilience planner, also in the Division of Sustainability and Resilience in City Planning. Um, and I come from this, I come at this from a perspective of uh, measurement and making sure that the city is strong in the areas where we, we need to be strong to be able to handle, um, you know, shocks and, and stresses like we're currently experiencing. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Kate. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Pendrack. I'm the Sustainable Development Goals Fellow this summer. I'm a master's student at Carnegie Mellon University, but uh, for the past several years, I've held various positions with the city of Pittsburgh. So my perspective that I'm bringing is sort of the mix of an insider and an outsider being able to understand how the city functions, but able to come at it in a very objective way to run the Sustainable Development Goals work this summer. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, to each of, you, each of you for taking uh, the time. Uh, just a note about the broadcast. We also have two wonderful ASL interpreters with us today. We have Iris and Megan. You'll see them at different points during the broadcast. Uh, but like I mentioned before, we have a couple slides that we want to show and a website that we're going to scroll through um, to take a look at some of the resources and break these down a little further. Uh, for those of us or for those of you that are joining us during the live broadcast, uh, you will just see those screens. The interpreters will not be visible. It'll be fixed in editing after the fact, so you'll continue to see it. We just wanted to thank them for uh, their help in making these calls more accessible. All right, friends, we have a lot to get into today and a lot of topics and a lot of definitions. So let's start with like a high level overview. Uh, Grant, I'm gonna go to you first, sir. 
uh, we're going to talk about the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, what are they and what are we talking about when we mention them? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, effectively what the SDGs are in kind of a quick, easy term is a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable community for all. So they were developed as a process of all of the member states of the United Nations back between 2015 and 2017, uh, basically to create that framework of an integrated development pathway for all of the member countries to guide themselves for in terms of achieving outcomes by the year 2030. Uh, so our engagement with the SDGs really began uh, following the completion of our 1PGH resilience strategy. Uh, being a part of kind of the global network of cities through the Rockefeller Foundation 100 Resilient Cities Network really exposed us to kind of these different uh, conversations that were happening around the world with regards to sustainability and resilience. And the 17 goals that were created by the, the UN effectively became that architecture that we started to recognize that we were doing this work, um, but not knowing we were doing this work. Um, and as we completed the work of the 1PGH strategy, we were looking for different ways in which we could measure performance, um, really to create a system of accountability, not just for ourselves, but also uh, to be able to benchmark ourselves against other communities uh, nationally and internationally uh, in terms of identifying best practices and different tactics and strategies that we might uh, implement and deploy here in the city of Pittsburgh to achieve some of the outcomes that are designed through the SDG process. Uh, so for that work, we began uh, kind of intersecting this really on the foundation and the heels of uh, kind of the work that Rebecca and Rick led with the Equality Indicators Project. Um, so this was kind of our first foray into really, as a, as a city government, as a municipal government, measuring inequality or a, across the city. Um, and they'll talk more about that a little bit later on in, in the conversation. But what we started to see was these parallels between the 17 SDGs and the 81 different indicators that we identified through the, uh, the equality indicators process. So we started to map that um, to understand kind of, you know, where we currently are uh, and realize that we we're in a really f uh, formative position as a city government and that not many city governments were really taking this path in terms of uh, measuring performance uh, uh, against the SDGs. So with that, we joined a network uh, uh, that was sponsored by the Brookings Institution that brought together uh, 10 other cities from around the world. Uh, you, in the United States, it, it consists of Orlando, New York, Los Angeles, and Pittsburgh, and then uh, six other kind of international cities. And New York City was one of the first, uh, then followed by Los Angeles in developing what's called a VLR, or Voluntary Local Review. Typically, kind of nation states have taken kind of this, this step in terms of reviewing their policies and practice against those 17 goals. And we are now kind of uh, both through our adoption as an administration, but now through kind of Kate's work, starting to create our own process of, of local measurement. Um, so really starting to integrate kind of the work that we do as a local government against these 17 goals. Um, so it's been kind of an internal process for us, um, you know, working kind of at the, the micro level, kind of within city government, but also kind of at you know, the macro and the meso levels, uh, effectively creating kind of international connections and leaning on those. But then the other thing that we've done is created a local network. Mm -hmm. um, so working with local nonprofit organizations, um, the private sector through the Allegheny Conference, um, who has also adopted the SDGs, Carnegie Mellon University who has adopted the SDGs, to really start to create a local network of, of best practices um, and kind of sharing our insights in terms of both measurement protocols, but also it's ultimately about the solutions. What are the policies and practices that we could implement to help improve people's lives? Thanks, Grant. So you mentioned this idea of, of cities thinking about performance, and yet this doesn't happen in isolation. You mentioned there are nonprofit partners, university partners. Um, it, how do you describe like the philosophy of how a city thinks about performance that has informed this work? Because, you know, cities, uh, I mean, it's, it's a huge thing and there's all these different working pieces and stuff. Where do you begin when you start thinking about performance? 
Yeah, you know, so coming from kind of the world of sustainability, which is really based upon kind of what we call the three E's, the equity, the environment, and the economy, and kind of the intersection of those. And one of the things I always tell people when they ask me, like, well, what is sustainability? I say, well, sustainability, you have to begin to understand that it's not an end state. It's a system of continuous improvement and adaption to kind of challenges, um, risks and threats, which is kind of where our, our resilience work comes into play. But effectively, we in the sustainability space have always been kind of measuring, um, you know, different aspects, whether that's our energy consumption or um, the number of street trees that we have, you know, these different kind of aspects in, in terms of kind of the environmental and economic performance. But we also felt the need to really get uh, integrated in terms of how uh, sustainability from a community and individual humanistic standpoint exists. Um, and that's really what started, uh, you know, our partnership with kind of Rick and the Office of Equity in terms of integrating some of these aspects in terms of how are we really impacting people's everyday lives through the services that we provide as a local government. Um, and that's where the, these kind of worlds really start to intersect. And you know, ultimately why the SDGs are such an interesting framework in that regard is that they really help foster cross-sector collaboration. The idea that goals one and three or goals four and six you know, can, can, can find intersections and the opportunities for different sectors to collaborate, which is ultimately what's needed for a more successful city. That makes sense. Rebecca, I'd like to turn uh, to you. So we've kind of heard this high level overview uh, from Grant. Um, walk us through what this actually looks like. So you have these, these overarching goals. Uh, you have these, these metrics, say, as a city that you're focused on, you're moving towards. Um, but then you also need to engage with community, engage with residents, engage with the internal stakeholders. And from an accountability standpoint, start talking about what this work looks like. And there's been a number of reports that uh, Pittsburgh has been a part of and has published itself that has led us uh, to where we are now, uh, given your work uh, within the team and, and, and your role, um, how, how, is this, how does the sausage actually, actually get made? What does it look like? Sure, thanks Josiah. So, um, you know, I'm flashing my screen right now uh, so you can kind of see the progression of reports that we've had. Um, so in 2015, uh, the city adopted P4 standards, which, is, which stands for People, Planet, Place, and Performance. Um, so any work that we've done since 2015 has really made sure that those, you know, four pillars have been a part of that work. Um, in 2016, we then uh, entered into uh, work with a, a program called 100 Resilient Cities, which was powered by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and this is uh, what brought uh, me actually into the city. So I was funded through the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and we developed what was called a preliminary resilience assessment. Um, so we uh, developed this look at what the city's shocks and stresses are. So shocks are those slow, uh, the, sorry, shocks are those, you know, one-time major events like a global pandemic, mm -hmm. um, whereas stresses are these slow burning, um, you know, underlying issues uh, such as, you know, inequality, uh, for example, in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, what we did in 2017 with the resilience strategy was try to figure out, okay, we have this profile, um, how do we make the city stronger so that we're addressing those stresses, underlying stresses up front, um, so that we're prepared to handle the shocks when they arise. Um, and then uh, in 2018, we got into, um, because you know, uh, economic and racial inequality in Pittsburgh was identified as a major underlying stress, um, we then were able to develop uh, what was called the Pittsburgh Equity Indicators, which Rick will talk a little bit more about. Um, and the Equity Indicators was, um, you know, we had 80 indicators where we measured um, outcomes for two different groups, either high and low income, black and white population. Um, but we were able to start to pinpoint some of the, the challenges that we really need to address to, to identify all those stresses, to handle all those stresses. Um, and then... Uh, in 2018, we developed the investment prospectus, um, which is a look at the 47 most important projects um, that, that we feel are necessary uh, to implement in Pittsburgh to really be a resilient city. Um, and those are all costed out so that we you know, have them ready to go when grants arise or um, know what we're applying for in, in, in budget season. Um, and based on all of that, uh, you know, the, the sustainable development goals, uh, 
you know, came out fairly recently. So we were already into our process when the sustainable development goals were really released. Um, but we've now, we now see them as um, a measurement framework. So originally, you know, the equity indicators report was a, was a great beginning framework. Um, but the SDGs are a little bit more of a holistic view. Um, so we're looking at the SDGs and all 17 of them so that we're, you know, mapping uh, these different reports to those SDGs to make sure that we're, we're not seeing any gaps. Um, and community engagement wise throughout this entire process, um, you know, we've engaged more than 2,500 Pittsburghers. So we've really made sure that we've, you know, built, you know, P4 was just the, the values framework. Um, the preliminary resilience assessment was, you know, an analysis of what our problems are. Uh, the resilience strategy was how to address those problems. The equity indicators report was to make sure that, you know, those problems are going to be addressed uh, so that they're equitable and everybody has the chance to thrive. And then the investment prospectus identifies what, what those projects need to be. Um, so they've all built on, on top of each other. So that engagement that we've done up front um, and that we've continued to do throughout is is really cumulative. It's 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 so useful seeing it broken out in this manner, and and it also uh, demonstrates it might not be immediately obvious, but this cross sector approach that Grant mentioned a second ago. You have P four. This is the Heinz Endowments local partners uh, with this framework, uh, and yet and then you mentioned we do uh, like the hundred resilient cities work through the Rockefeller Foundation and stuff like this. When did it start to become apparent? that this localized focus could be mapped to international goals? Like when did it start to be a, we can compare with other cities and start to like exp explore best practices and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, there's a certain amount of measurement that we want to do against ourselves um, first. And I, I think the, the sustainable development goals really allow for that holistic look of, you know, how are we doing on our own? And then how are we doing compared to other cities? And how are we doing globally? Um, so, I mean, especially when you think about, uh, you know, like environmental. So, you know, I come from the sustainability and resilience division. So we think in environmental terms a lot. Um, and a lot of the work that we do on emissions reduction really has more of that global uh, flavor to it. Um, so, you know, when you're able to take, you, you know, the, the things that we're doing, uh, you know, especially environmentally, um, that will benefit us locally, we can also see how that projects out globally, which is really helpful. That makes sense. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Rick, I'd like to talk with you, man. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the equity indicators, uh, and certainly in my time in the mayor's office, uh, and before, I think, quite frankly, this is something I've heard you speak a lot about, um, I will have some questions about what the local landscape looks like, but given how you've heard the conversation, uh, what comes to your mind when you think about this topic and, and the work of the equity indicators? Well, the equity indicators, like Rebecca had said, is, it gave us a, a framework of measurement uh, locally to look at ourselves in those 80 areas. And as you look at, unfortunately, with this global pandemic, you know, the major issues that rise up, food insecurity, housing, employment, education, gender equality. These are all issues that are kind of raising up and they were already in, they were already measured in the indicators uh, that these were areas of inequality and now it's just exasperated even more. So this is a situation where it's not a nice to, it's, it's, it's a we have to do or a must do uh, as we kind of move forward in developing this framework in connecting with residents um, where they are, right where they are and being able to service where they are. And that's where the Office of Equity is coming in play with all the different new initiatives that were coming through throughout this office is concerned. So it really fits nicely um, in our progression in this work. And the SDGs allow us to use a framework, not just locally, but like nationally uh, and internationally to, mm -hmm. to do this. And so, um, a lot of discussions that I've had with you and my colleagues is that how, who do we partner with to be able to kind of reach into the community, be able to explain what's going on, and being able to uh, allow people to kind of participate in this process with us and also see the results of it from the work that we're doing. So I guess there was a, a I guess a dichotomy, so to speak, of where you have this theoretical framework for a sustainability is concerned but also how do we kind of we relate that. And so now we're able to bring those pieces together 
um, in, in a nice way that people see the work and then they say, oh yeah, they're doing national work, but they're also servicing us here in the city of Pittsburgh. That's really helpful. So let's, let's bring it to a specific example, kind of thought exercise, Rick. Um, we, you and I have both been to Home with Children's Village events. Uh, let, let's, let's say that we're at a, a Homewood Children's Village community dinner. They do that about quarterly. In Homewood, uh, you know, I guess it would be, have to be virtual right now. But say we're there engaging with the community. And how would you frame what, the work around the SDGs given these intersections? Like how would you, how would you make the, the connection from overarching like measurement framework, UN, different cities, international focus, down to community level, this is what it means to you? Um, you know, in our prep call, we were talking about lighting yep. and, you know, the energy use of the lighting and how expensive it is, you know, for the fluorescent bulbs and so forth in our homes right now. And a lot of people still have those fluorescent bulbs compared to LED lighting and you know, LED lighting is more, it, they, they save energy for the most part. They last longer and the cost goes down. And so now we're relating that to the pockets of people. You know, you figure our energy bills, we have cost burden in regards to our housing situation. So you index the couple SDGs right there. When we talk about housing costs and the housing cost burdens and, you know, and expenses to be able to live, you could utilize that savings for other things that you need and necessary items. Very helpful, thank you, Rick. Okay, so let's talk about the local landscape. It's been mentioned a couple times and you've alluded to it that there's a number of organizations in different sectors that are uh, thinking about the SDGs. Uh, many of them have adopted the SDGs or some of them, et cetera. Uh, what can you tell us about the kind of regional conversation about this and the potential for cross-sector collaboration from here? Well, while we were doing uh, the equity indicators, uh, we, we partnered with the Forbes Fund and, and Fred Brown uh, to be a mediator. Uh, and he has been a leader in kind of moving that forward in his organization in regards to how he does grant making. And so a lot of his grant making um, out in his application is he has, where is your work related to the SDGs? And that's far as his decision making. So now he's already aligned people who receive funding from him of what work is already being done with the nonprofit sector, you know, that receive money from the Forbes fund. And so we've already kind of engaged him in this process in, in doing that. And a lot of his work is aligned to that. Then we decided we needed to be able to be on the ground and being able to develop an education network in regards to that and start convening with this process with other stakeholders. So we partnered with the Cor Coral Pittsburgh. And Coral Pittsburgh, you know, and this is our plan to be able to develop a curriculum that can share in the placements that the Coral Fellows are going to. Um, and some of them are corporations, some of them are public sector, some of them are nonprofit, some of them are universities and where they're different, where they're placed, you know, how they can work on where they're, where they're at to align the work. Can you give us some, uh, some examples and like the corporate community that you've seen that you think are interesting for uh, how some folks have approached it? Um, uh, I was sharing with you that I was on a TED, I watched a TED talk earlier um, yeah. about uh, uh, Ikea and how they're dealing with solo panel, panels and how they're stocking their shelves, you know, um, the LED lighting example that I just gave and, and, and so forth, and yeah. how they're restructuring their leadership uh, that be gender, uh, the gender equality on there. And so they've already kind of bought into that process, you know, and how they partner with uh, different foundations and organizations uh, dealing with SDGs and so forth with the needs within those goals. Um, I mentioned to you um, Cavestro, you know, that has been kind of the, the known leader, so to speak, in regards to the type of work that they're doing on the various levels that they're engaged in all of the SDGs, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, some people may debate on, you know, of them adopting various pieces of it, but, you know, far as their framework and their business model, they said, okay, we're, we're going to say on the high level, we're going to be involved with a number of them. And then some we're, we're going to have just a little bit of activity. And then the last, 
you know, that we're supporting efforts that do that. We know we don't do these things, but we're all supporting these efforts. And as you know, and as we have these discussions, the interconnectivity of it all, yeah. um, we've adopted it uh, as far as the city of Pittsburgh and, and our various departments are, are being aligned with that work. And so how are they doing our business, how we're doing our business models and encouraging other people to use their business models as they move forward. Um, this is a this is a whole effort regionally and nationally, and so us as a city, we don't have the money to 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 handle all of the SDGs, and we understand that, and we understand that we have to collaborate uh, with various entities that are doing the work, like Sustainability uh, Pittsburgh, like Green Building Alliance, uh, the amazing work at 412 Rescue um, that's doing to expand out and basically their work that they've done. Uh, and dealing with the pandemic and, and changing their model uh, to serve the needs of our residents. Got so it. as you kind of look at the, the total framework, we've provided that opportunity for people to connect at various points. And we want to make it easier uh, for that to happen, um, developing this network that Grant had talked about locally uh, as far as an ecosystem service. I appreciate that. One last question for you, and then I want to talk with uh, with Grant and Kate about how uh, what the, the process looks like moving forward from here. Uh, Rick, you mentioned that this lets different entities kind of take a look at their own operations, their own objectives, and see how they might play. Um, you're a member of the Gender Equity Commission here. How does this work look even to like the commission level, uh, and how, would, how do you think the approach is there? Well, I mean, the, the history of the gender equity, it started as the Bill of Rights for Women that started in uh, 19, 1979. And so we have based that off of a, a, the CEDAW model, which is the Convention to End Discrimination Against Women. And so they are already locked into uh, goal number five. And most of, as far as the SDGs are concerned, and so a lot of the work that the Gender Equity Commission is, is working off of those SDGs, well, that particular SDG, but also things that are catered to the city and some of the challenges that we see. Got it, thank you so much. Uh, Grant, Kate, so uh, we hear this conversation and I remember looking at the slide here and this idea of, uh, you know, you're doing this local assessment, you're comparing with other cities, uh, then you're saying with the investment perspectives, here's what, in terms of like funding and budgets, how we can approach this here, uh, and now it looks like uh, this voluntary local review is the next step in that process. We start to, uh, to engage down to even more of a micro level uh, as time goes on. Uh, frame this up for us and then tell us how, how this actually works. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, you see with nation states or kind of one of the objectives of the SDGs was to create what is called a voluntary national review. Hmm. Um, and in the absence of that being done here in the U.S., several cities have now started to take the mantle to say, hey, what does this really look like at the local level and then voluntarily report uh, kind of our progress towards the global goals on a voluntary basis? Hmm. And, you know, so what, what we looked at was kind of on the heels of committing to the SDGs, we're going to need some capacity to help uh, us internally, you know, basically shine a mirror in front of our face and see like, you know, where are we strong, where are we weak, and effectively how can we improve ourselves? And that's where we were able to bring uh, Kate on board, uh, who had, you know, kind of the, the great experience of already working within the city, but stepping outside of city government for a little bit, and then have the ability now as a, a fellow through Carnegie Mellon University to step back in and start to make those connections between um, each of the different departments. And I'll let her talk about that in a second. But what's already been interesting, I think, is just our integration as a project team um, having the ability to interface uh, through the Office of Equity and the Division of Sustainability and Resilience and City Planning and, and the Commission on Human Relations um, and all the different kind of facets of city government, we all start to see things knit together um, mm. in a different way. But ultimately, how can we make progress moving forward? You know, Rick talked a little bit about the issue of energy burden, for example, which is one of those great kind of topics where it is a confluence of so many different issues. Um, so in the energy space and energy efficiency, you know, people are looking at that from the amount of energy people are consuming. But from the Commission on Human Relations standpoint, they're looking at, 
you know, the cost burden that households are facing. And from the Office of Equity, you're seeing kind of the impacts on people's mental and physical health and well-being. So all of a sudden, kind of these various stressors that Rebecca talks about starts to mold together. And what you see then is these confluences of the Venn diagram, right? Where then you're able to then start to prioritize, oh, hey, this is a problem in my shop. It's a problem in your shop. How do we start to work together to develop a, a really cohesive solution? And that's kind of what Kate's starting to do for us is to start to network that stuff together. And she can give you a look at that. Thanks. So, Kate, yeah, let's, let's walk through it. Uh, thanks for taking uh, the time to be on the call today. Uh, you and I first met because uh, you were already working in the mayor's office uh, when I joined, working with the mayor. Uh, we were buddies with River, uh, who I didn't tell you I saw not too long ago, within the past couple weeks on a bike ride. I know, right? He's doing great. All the Zoomies. Uh, shout out to that whole, whole family. Um, so let's talk about this work, uh, voluntary local review. I kind of give a similar scenario uh, to Rick. If you were at a community meeting with me and we were going to explain uh, to the community what this is, how would you go about doing it? And then let's talk about what it actually looks like. Definitely. So Grant's already done a really great job at explaining what VLR is and how it came to be from the voluntary national reviews, which are a nation's way to or, uh, voluntarily report on their progress to the SDGs and then New York creating their first voluntary local review in 2018, recognizing how important subnational governments, particular cities, are to achieving the global uh, agenda. So what the city of Pittsburgh is doing this summer is essentially doing our first voluntary local review, and that is to establish a baseline for us to compare future progress off of, so we know where we're starting. So, I think it's definitely important to, like you said, there's a lot of acronyms and definitions. I think it's always important to start and just explain everything. So I'm, now that we've, we've sort of established what VLRs are, um, I'll go a little bit more in depth in what word our VLR is looking like this summer. So we've broken it up into three phases. The first two, which will happen this summer, um, and then phase three will happen after the report is published. So phase one is localization. So as has been discussed uh, by multiple people on the call, the SDGs are written in a national context. They're written on a global scale. So on paper, they're not necessarily super relevant to cities. The essence of them is, that's why we're utilizing them, but there needs to be some tweaking to make them as beneficial to us as possible. So that was our first phase. Real recognizing how can we bring the SDGs to Pittsburgh in the best way possible for us to utilize them. And then phase two is mapping, and that's the phase we're currently in now. We're just finishing up. Mapping is where we are taking all Pittsburgh goals, targets, projects, initiatives, those types of things, and we're mapping it to the SDGs. Hmm. I was very lucky in that all of the uh, one PGH <laughs> uh, stuff had already been mapped by Rebecca and a former CMU student. Uh, so I got to come in and really just hone in on what projects the city is doing. Um, and so a few different exercises were done uh, this past month. The first was a survey that was sent out to all city employees for them to self-report on projects and initiatives that they are doing as they see them tying into the SDGs. And then our second exercise was a series of roundtable discussions. Uh, we grouped the SDGs as best as we could, as I think has been mentioned, the 17 SDGs are all interconnected. It's not really easy to break them up because they're all related, uh, but we did our best and we had a series of five really successful roundtable discussions uh, where we brought in uh, city employees, uh, employees of the authorities here in the, in the region, and we just talked about the work and the projects that everyone is doing. And one of the great benefits of that exercise is it's not just about soliciting that information for the review. It's also about creating those connections that didn't exist before. One thing that I loved to hear from the roundtable discussions was people were setting up meetings to talk further after the roundtable discussion and establishing those, uh, those connections and breaking down the silos of our departments so that they could better collaborate on issues that they're working on. Uh, and that goes for just within the city, city to authority, just within the authorities. Like it was, it was fantastic. And then we're also now taking a look at areas where we might not have 
got the information that we needed and we're hosting a series of bilateral meetings and just doing some last minute information finding and then uh, we'll be finishing up phase two of mapping by publishing our voluntary local review, which will be a report. And then phase three will be gap analysis. It's not just about doing a report, checking a box, saying that you've done it. It's about recognizing where are we not doing enough? Where could we be doing more? So that's what phase three is, taking a look at all of the projects and the initiatives that we've collected and mapped against the SDGs, which is a wonderful framework to be able to look at things intentionally, intersectionally, and you can recognize where you should be doing more. You can then use the SDGs and the, the framework to communicate with other cities, uh, such as LA, New York, Bristol, Helsinki, Orlando, and figure out what's working for them and seeing if it's implementable here in the city. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, just one last question for the sustainability resilience team in general. I'm curious, you know, it's been a number of years you all have been working uh, within this field, but specifically with and for the city around this. Um, has, I'm curious in your perspective on how people have engaged with this conversation. Are you seeing, kind of to Caitlin's point, uh, a growth in like organic enthusiasm and interest around this? Do you find yourself having to explain why this is important or is there kind of like a groundswell of attention and and yeah, enthusiasm around this. I can speak really quickly on this, just from uh, being at Carnegie Mellon, which as Grant said, has already signed on to the SDGs. There's a lot of excitement in the university space, as well as just as after we've explained the SDGs, such as in the round table discussions or in the survey, we aren't really having to explain to people why this is important. They get it and they're excited about it and they're, one of the last questions that we would ask in the round table uh, is how could we, how could you utilize the SDGs to further your work or how can the SDG PGH as, as it's been dubbed, how can this work benefit you? And there's so many ideas about the future of this work and how we can use this framework to, to better the, the lives of everyone in the city. Uh, so to answer your question, I have found that there is a lot of organic excitement over the SDGs. There's a reason we're doing this and it's definitely making me feel very fulfilled in my work. So that's just speaking from, from my experience talking with people about the SDGs. Thank you. Grant, Rebecca? Yeah, I, I just jump in real quickly, which is, you know, one of the things is that sustainability by its nature is a very complex place, right? Um, you're talking about systems changes and shifts and finding ways in which you can uh, tame that complexity and create bridges for people to walk across um, is really an important part of that pathway. And, you know, as we began, or, or not really, you know, in the early ages of kind of our work, Rebecca talked about the preliminary resilience assessment. One of the major stressors that we have in Pittsburgh is this issue of fragmentation. Um, and that is often viewed in terms of just a government lens. We have a lot of different types of governments, but it really extends into other sectors as well and between sectors. Mm. So finding ways in which we can help facilitate kind of that cross-sector collaboration is really important. Um, you know, so the SDGs help provide that type of framework. The second thing that's been really interesting, I think, and, and Rick could probably attest to this as well, as we've organized locally with groups like the Forbes funds and Coro and um, the YWCA and others, it has been to point Kate point a really organic process where every meeting that we've had with that group, it seems to kind of grow um, in terms of, Hey, I heard about this and we're doing X on SDG number fill in the blank. Um, you know, so it's really kind of a big tent type of opportunity in order to start to facilitate those types of collaborative ventures. I would just add really quickly too, um, whereas we've seen a lot of really good and positive engagement and a lot of buy-in from you know, institutions, the nonprofit sector, um, the, the universities and, and the corporate arena, um, I think you know, other cities have had a lot of success bringing that down to the resident level um, and I think that, uh, you know, we still have a lot of work to do in that, in that space, but I think that this is a really good initial conversation to start to get people familiar with the SDGs and how, you know, they can contribute to them in their own life and how, you know, it can better quality of life in Pittsburgh. 
Yeah, it reminds and me. I just want to jump into uh, Josiah, if I could. You know, we have an opportunity to Pittsburgh size um, our SDGs. And, you know, we have different models internationally and locally uh, to look from. Um, like Hawaii Green Grove had different community meetings and so forth um, compared to uh, Orlando um, with Chris Cato's work. Um, so, and we have Bristol uh, that I would say that would be the best um, that I've seen in regards to international and local work and how they engage their leadership and then how they are charged uh, as far as their different departments and how they're reaching their SDGs in, in multiple areas. So we have different models. We just have to Pittsburgh size our models, but also our goals and our targets that relate to the, the regular residents in the community uh, for on a neighborhood level. And so if we're able to accomplish that, we have buy-in on all levels. And as Grant had mentioned, the partnerships that we started to create, we also had to look at how do we talk in their language for them to understand it, for them to implement use. And so that's kind of where we're at now at, at this point, looking at the different languages on the multiple levels, whether it be nonprofit, corporate, university. So, you know, so the VLR helps us do that, and as well as the SDGs and being able to Pittsburghize our targets. And the track record of this work at this point, we're not talking about a single report at this place, at this point, we're not talking about even like a series of tweets at this point. Uh, there's a body of work here. Um, and there's a, a slide, we didn't get to it today, maybe later in the conversation where you can see what that mapping kind of looks like, where some of our local objectives and how they tie directly in. It reminds me of, of community meetings I've, I've gone to with like the Larmer Consensus Group, for example. It wasn't framed as far as the SDGs, but you have residents talking about how they uh, put a cistern in their backyard and it had reduced their utility cost and they're able to use this water in different ways uh, and that is the that's the same work that's the the same idea uh, but down to that uh, to that micro level uh, Megan before I go down too much of a uh, macro meso and micro rabbit hole um, thank you so much for your patience and uh, for listening to this conversation I'm very curious where your mind goes listening to what's been said but I wonder if you could take uh, the time uh, to explain to us the work that you do and what exactly a Commission on Human Relations is Sure. Um, well, thank you all. I mean, you guys have all been doing this work for longer than I have. Um, and not to jump ahead in the question, but I, just hearing this team talk about these things always brings up so many thoughts for me about if I, as a public official, didn't know about all of this, right? Like, what do our residents know? And so really, how do we get this information out there? But more to come on that. Um, so the Commission on Human Relations, as I said in my introduction, um, we're actually celebrating our 65th year um, this year. So we are one of the oldest commissions in the country, um, started in 1955. And so we investigate complaints of discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations. As you can imagine, that covers a lot of aspects of life in Pittsburgh. Um, we also do outreach and education. So right now we're working, for example, on a youth outreach series that will involve some different contests around art and media to really understand, particularly at this moment in time, right? Like what does civil rights mean to us in Pittsburgh? What does inequality mean? How does it show up in our daily lives? Um, so we do a lot of that work. And I think one of the things for me that draws me to this work um, sort of besides my, my past work is the idea that the commission, you know, because we take complaints, we tend to be reactive, right? So somebody brings us a problem and then we're working on it. We're investigating, we're trying to um, come up with a remedy, we're trying to mediate a case. I think the city government and a lot of local governments tend to be reactive in a lot of ways, right? Like we see a problem and then we're trying to fix it. I think what the SDGs can do um, there's a couple of things. I think one, to Rick's point, it can give us a common language. So yes, we are doing like work. We're doing a lot of good things. But if we can ground that in a common language so we can all say, I'm working around goal five right now, right? I'm really working on gender equality. At the commission, we touch a lot of these. We work on no poverty. We're working on reduced inequalities, gender equality, um, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And that's a really important one right now. So I think instead of saying we're doing all of these great things, if we can all sort of align our work with that, then we can show what we prioritize as a city, as a government, and what we're hearing from residents that they need and what areas those fall into. 
Thank you. So how do you describe where and how the commission is positioned relative to city governments and the different pieces at play? Sure. So the commission is actually an independent part of the city, which sounds odd, right? Because we're city employees, um, but we're part of the Home Rule Charter for the city of Pittsburgh to be an independent body. Um, so we don't fall under any administration. We do obviously work with the administration and different departments and with city council. Um, but we also hold ourselves really responsive to the community. Um, so we, because we investigate and we can investigate the city as a housing provider, as an employer, um, as delivering public accommodations and services, it's important that we maintain independence and neutrality. Um, and that also allows us to sort of have our feet in both worlds of understanding some of the inner operations of local government while seeing, as you pointed out before, some of the fragmentation and how some things don't get out to residents. And so we hear from residents about these issues. Um, so I think that we're really well positioned to hear from both sides and to help. I'm so grateful to be part of this team to work on solutions. I know that um, Kate brought up New York City did a voluntary local review. Something that they found is that in their sort of initial first draft, they forgot to include their commission on human rights. Um, which would be our counterpart there. And when they did that, they actually left out a lot of really valuable data that that commission had. And so I think making sure when you're doing this work that you're bringing in all aspects of government, not just the ones that might first come to your mind is important. Makes a lot of sense. So I wonder what, how you would uh, frame the concept of equity given the work that you do. It's, it might seem kind of obvious at first glance, but I mean, you're all the way from the systemic level down to individual you know, neighbors, What's the role of equity in the work that you do? I mean, equity is our, our guiding light, and it's something that I think we'll always be striving for. There are so many issues. You know, for example, um, I can say I fully believe housing is a human right. So, like, the right to affordable, safe, decent, free from discrimination housing is a human right that we're all entitled to. But we aren't there yet. And in 65 years of doing this work just in Pittsburgh, we aren't there. Um, and I think that these things change over time. I think equity for me from a government standpoint is also moving away from just these are our priorities or these are the catchphrases and I don't want SDGs to sort of become that but this is really what we're doing this is our plan to make things better that we're constantly elevating lived experience we are getting feedback from the community and we're not just staying in silos um, as director of the commission that's actually been one of the harder things um, to sort of understand how different government departments can do great work, but then you might not hear about it. And why is that? And how can we have a more horizontal structure where we're all sharing these ideas and that residents get to play a part in that? Even going down to things like making the budget, right? Like it's, it's taxpayer money. How can residents be a part of the decision-making about prioritizing where money goes? So for me, equity is, is really broad-based. And I think that there needs to be a lot of accountability around this. And I'm hoping that the SDGs, again, can lend us this common language so that we can say, you said that you were working on no poverty, but I'm still seeing poverty all around me. What are we doing about this and how will we get there? Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned, too, that the idea that um, it gives a chance to break down some of these silos. And there's also collaboration between, say, departments within government, but also uh, cross-sector collaboration. Uh, you all have a really cool partnership with Create Lab. Uh, I wondered if you would talk to us about how that came to be, what it's focused on, and I think you have uh, some something to show us while we while we chat. Sure. So I'm going to try to share my screen. I apologize if there's like a slight delay in time here. Okay. Okay. So we have been partnering. Um, for about a year now with the CMU Create Lab. They have this fabulous data visualization tool that they um, created called EarthTime. So EarthTime is basically, instead of just having static maps, which is what we often see, we get to have data visualizations that are like time-lapsed sequences, and then they thread together with a narrative arc. So you're clicking from one map to the next. And when you do that, you're able to piece together not just one snapshot in time, but what is happening to communities across Pittsburgh over time, how have things changed, which is sometimes the story of how things have gotten better, and sometimes it's how things have gotten worse or they haven't changed. Um, you'll see here we have one of our main stories is about affordability and fair housing, and I know that housing is something 
on everyone's mind right now during the pandemic with an eviction moratorium that's only set to last for another month that was luckily extended. Um, but with people, you know, not being able to pay rent right now. And even before that, with a shortage last we counted of 20,000 affordable units, but then huge new developments going in and, and who do those um, developments serve. So I won't actually click on this because I'm worried that it's a bit too much data for a, a screen share, but anybody can go onto this site. It's pgh.earthtime.org. And what we really hope to do in this collaboration was take these ideas that we're talking about, about equity, about housing, about the environment, about transportation, right? Public transit and how we access it and really take a snapshot of how does it affect vulnerable and marginal, marginalized populations? Um, who is getting the benefit of development and changes over time? And where do we need to really focus our attention? Um, so one example is that we have a Pittsburgh in the environment story um, that we were lucky enough to work with Dr. Jamil Bay on from Urban Kind Institute. Um, and he and I for Earth Day this week, or this year, did um, a presentation really talking about when we look at um, traditionally black or low income communities and then the rates of childhood asthma that needs hospitalization or urgent care. Um, and we're looking at pollution sources in Pittsburgh. So all these ideas that Grant and Rebecca and Kate and Rick touched on, but then really taking it out to the community. So not just what is it doing for the city of Pittsburgh as a government, but how are these decisions affecting residents and children and the next generation and what can we do to make that better for people? Yeah. The great thing is it's all public data. So anybody can go on to these. Um, they're fully explorable. You can actually zoom in basically to where you live and you can look at what's happening in your neighborhood. Josiah, you mentioned being at community meetings. You can be at a community meeting and you can look at your neighborhood and show changes over time, whether it's um, demographics or evictions or you want to look at the tree the benefit of trees planted and maintained by the city all sorts of different things and we're always adding to this um, and we are actually working right now with Kate and with um, Tyler who's another intern on creating a Pittsburgh specific SDG data story that really gives a snapshot of where we are now so that we can figure out where we need to go and how to get there that's terrific. Thank you so much for that. We'll make sure that's linked uh, in the in the notes, show notes, so to speak, and in the chat as well, so that folks can do uh, a deeper dive. Um, I've seen some of the visualizations. I've had the privilege of seeing some of them um, during the GARE training last year, looking at housing uh, in particular, and it's fascinating. It's just super interesting uh, to take a look at. And quite actually, the last one of these equity series conversations we did was around housing. Folks can check out uh, that conversation too to learn from leaders. Uh, in that space. But it's just a great example of where not, it's not just esoteric cross-sector collaboration, but what are the tools that it gives? Well, now we have a way to, to do even storytelling down to the neighborhood level using data uh, right. that's available uh, to really exemplify what it is that we're talking about. Uh, I'd like to open up the conversation to everybody here. Um, what is, you know, we talk about this idea of resilience, sustainability, and equity, and yet, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, and um, and quite frankly, a lot of the investments in this, in this work uh, has paid off. Uh, I listen to what the mayor says about the position we're in as a city, and a lot of uh, the, the, the foresight into treating this like a priority has seemed to pay off in terms of where we're at currently. Um, what does the future of this work look like uh, to each of you? And given, given COVID, certainly, but also given where Pittsburgh is positioned in this global conversation around what this looks like uh, in cities. I mean, one, one place that I would start is that when we think about the global pandemic, you know, one of the, Rebecca and I, I had this conversation on Friday with uh, our partners from the RAND Corporation who helped develop the preliminary resilience as assessment for us. And, you know, every shock and stress that uh, we identify in that preliminary resilience assessment back in, what was it, 2014, 2015, Rebecca, 2015, excuse me, um, you know, has come to fruition. Right. <laughs> um, whether whether it is, uh, you know, the issues around housing and race or uh, weather-related events or even a global pandemic, residents, as part of our community outreach activities, basically raise these as issues, right? Um, so when we look at the preliminary resilience assessment, it's a foundational document because it consists of both kind of the statistical data as well as kind of 
human uh, human data, right? Like the, this, the scenarios provided by people, residents of the city of Pittsburgh. And as a result of that, I think one of the things that it leads us towards and why the SDGs as a framework is really important is how do you create a just and sustainable recovery? So as we think about the pandemic and we're still in like the fog of it, right? Like we're, we're still trying to figure out, you know, the immediate response. Um, but as we have to transition, we now need to start to lay the foundations of what life with the virus will look like and what life without the virus will look like. So how do we basically build a, you know, a stronger community going forward? And we're really in, I think, in a good position given kind of this type of work and the people that you see on the screen um, to help facilitate that transition. Um, it begins with a value base. We're not starting from kind of a, a, you know, a zero set, but we have some building blocks that we've established in the last couple of years that allow us to build on top of that. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? What, what, what comes to mind? So I'll go. Um, I think what I'm excited about, which is an odd thing to say in the middle of a pandemic, um, but you know, if we're not thinking about equity now, we're never going to be, right? In the middle of a pandemic when um, vulnerabilities and inequities are just even more exacerbated, right? This is the time to really be planning for what we need to do next. And thus far, the work in the VLR that Kate's been doing, right, has really been internally focused. What are we doing? What's our baseline within the city? I'm really excited for us to take this to the community and say like, what do you need, right? So we know where we are, we know what we're doing. But we should base our priorities on what people need, um, like what Grant was talking about, the human data, the anecdotal experience is really important. And something that we work uh, with the Create Lab on is sort of pairing what are the stories that we're hearing over and over and over again with the data so that we can get this full scope picture. And so the thing that excites me about the SDGs and the work here is that instead of just giving us a report, you know, reports are great, but I think we know about the issues. We know what's going on. We can continually learn, but we've got to have some targets and indicators in place so we'll know when we get there and then what we need to keep doing to meet the needs of our critical communities. So I'm really excited to see when we get community feedback, what shape this work takes. Yeah, I would, I would just add, um, you know, to build on what Grant and Megan have said, um, we've done a lot of pre-work and a lot of engagement to develop, um, you know, all the, all the goals that we've, we've set out and, and you know, the myriad of strategies that um, we shared earlier. Um, I think it's really, you know, it's, it's easy to make, it's not easy, but, you know, it's easier to make a, a report and set a bunch of goals than it is to actually implement those goals. Um, and I think, uh, you know, an opportunity arises during a pandemic when we've also had a lot of social unrest. I think there's a big groundswell of wanting to, you know, not go back to the old normal, but to create something new. Um, so I think that, you know, this is an opportunity to take a lot of um, the work that we've done envisioning uh, pre-pandemic and be able to implement that going forward to build a better Pittsburgh. <laughs> And then I'll kind of jump in and talk about, you know, the protocols and procedures. Uh, as we look at things, um, we look at the social impacts of people and how it's affected, you know, whether it be um, looking at gender-based budgeting, uh, for example, that the Gender Equity Commission is doing. And then also having the community being part of the research and engage them um, in this process, and which would lead to some policy changes. Uh, that we do that they had a part in and then they actually could live out um, what they were involved with and then also benefit from it, uh, from of those, those changes from their lens. Um, because bottom line, we're all uh, public servants. And so if we're not serving the people, then who are we serving? And, and so that's where it brings us back to the core of our work and why we choose this work kind of moving forward. And then it gives us an opportunity to, to connect on a different level, um, providing these recommendations and listening and changing things. And again, we're addressing the inequalities, we're creating that new normal and everybody's involved with it and it's a shared process. It's not a top down, it's, it's, a, it's a bottom up 
uh, approach with everybody involved and there's no heads or no, you know, everybody has a seat at the table. And, and so that's why we've been very intentional in doing this work to make sure that we include people from all different sectors uh, in this process. I appreciate that. I'm wondering another question for everybody. Uh, you, you all are so thoughtful to, to make clear that this is, first of all, not new work, but it's ongoing work, um, but that it's also something where, you know, different folks play their role and that's what contributes to the success. So I'm wondering if you were to say what success looks like from here, how you would, how you would phrase that? Because for, quite frankly, I hear, um, you know, the names of different cities. I hear Helsinki, I hear, I hear New York, and I think, well, we have some things going for us here. You know, how can we really be a leader in this, you know, in this space? I believe we're the, the second, was it a hundred resilient city we as part of the second cohort? So I recognize we've kind of been to a certain extent on the forefront of this already. But if we were to say, you know, Grant Urban in five years would be very, very happy about where Pittsburgh is with things, uh, or and Meg and Kate, Rebecca, what, uh, Rick, what would it look like? What, what, what does success kind of look like in the near term? Josiah, we can never be satisfied. We, we have to I hear that. <laughs> we have to keep striving. That's the tweet. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that I think about in this, and this has been, um, I think one of the great things about engaging with other cities, right? And, you know, the benefit of that is, is us as kind of civil servants, we're learning from our peers, right? So we're able to Kind of take other ideas from another city and apply them here in Pittsburgh to kind of our, our craft and the work that we're doing. One, one of the things I think is um, was really two things that are have been really illustrative that we've seen as part of our SDG Cities Network, and Rick could probably lead into this too, is one, the communications of the SDGs, that it's not just a city thing, but it is um, it is adopted and visible by other sectors. Um, and I, I think about this in terms of, you know, I, I was on a tour of a water plant, um, or a district heating plant in, in uh, a community in Sweden a, a while back. And the executive director of the plant was talking about the SDGs. Um, you know, and, and so it's that type of executive integration um, that is, allows people to see it from the top, but also it kind of permeates um, throughout the entire organization and, and into the community. So that visibility is one. The second thing, um, and we've seen this with a lot of our other uh, kind of European partners, is aligning their procurement with the SDGs. So really thinking about how and what they buy and who and where they buy it from. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you see that, that these value sets get aligned, not just as kind of a talking point or within um, kind of the policy and code, but really in the practice. Um, you know, and we've seen this recently with um, kind of a contractor that we have uh, hired a company called NLX, which is working with us on kind of our renewable energy procurement strategy they as a company have adopted the SDGs and report kind of their performance, much like what we're doing with Kate's assistance through the VLR to other corporate platforms. So we're, we're speaking the same language, not just on energy, but as, ent as business entities, right? Um, and I think that's one of the things that is also scalable, not just from a global corporation, but down to small and mid-sized businesses as well. So those, those, those two things, I think communications and procurement are, are two places where we're going to start to see more and more adoption and integration of these where you bring together kind of, you know, the, the attention to the goals is unified. Got it. Anyone else? I'll just kind of add to what uh, Grant was talking about, because as we look at the, the different countries internationally, they have a social return in regards to their procurement, in regards to their workforce. And, and basically the vendors that they use um, have an investment in all the way to the society. Um, so whole countries are actually saying that we're involved with SDGs and when we do our, our country procurement, we want the social return of workforce uh, on this particular contract and how much do you contribute in? And that's a requirement in the procurement 
that's a requirement in the procurement. And then that's how it's scored, not just the capabilities uh, that they have to do the work in the bidding process that we have normally here. We're, we're, they're asking for the return of how they're um, benefiting the residents in their country in regards to this procurement. And mm -hmm. so that's what Grant was talking about, that they're all invested in, and it's a whole country being involved with that. And they're having different points of entry where people are investing in this process. Mm -hmm. uh, do you all think that there's any, um, that the United States at some point might engage in their own voluntary uh, national review that will join uh, this global conversation as a, as a nation as well? Or do you really foresee the future of this work being uh, done through, through cities? Depends on November, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's hard to foresee such things, Josiah, but you know, I will say, I'll actually say that there's a, it just butts up so much against human rights and for the Human Rights City Alliance here in Pittsburgh, um, and a lot of cities have a human rights alliance, there is such a thing as a universal periodic review, which is much like the, the review that Kate is doing, sort of how are we doing about human rights in Pittsburgh, and there is a national review that goes to the UN. So. I would say that um, there are already people in this field that are sort of trailblazers in doing that work. So it is possible because I know that that um, is getting submitted. It will be uh, terrific for the nation to support them in a formal sense. Uh, but it's, you know, it's tough to see too far in the future these days. Uh, a couple last questions. Uh, one is a practical one for folks that might want to get involved or maybe they want to learn how their organization can get, uh, can formally adopt them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, where should we be directing people uh, to learn more and uh, and to engage if that's what they decide they'd like to do as an individual or as an organization. I, I would say from the organizational level, I mean, both both Rick and I are kind of points in contact on the the local uh, organizing of S, the STG network. So they could always reach out to us. Um, and like I said early on, like that's been kind of a an organic group. Um, from, you know, institutions of higher education to, um, you know, social service organizations, it really runs the gamut. Um, you know, one, one of the interesting stories I think that we've learned through our local uh, SDG network is like La Roche College, for example, up in the North Hills, has started to align their curriculum to the SDGs. Oh. Um, you know, or St. Edmunds Academy um, in, uh, in Squirrel Hill has also had kind of a you know, curriculum based approach to the SDGs. Uh, you know, so those, those are, those are kind of definitely ways I think for local organizations to plug in community organizations and the like, um, that are really good resources for everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Megan, any, any, uh, Rebecca, Kate, Rick, any other reach out to each of you individually, check out the websites kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, SDG, the United Nations has, you know, all kinds of websites that really dig a little bit deeper into like what the targets are, um, you know, and what each of the 17 goals are. So you can learn a lot more on that website. Um, our voluntary local review will also be public. So, I mean, you know, stay tuned for, for that release. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, one last question, just around the table, so to speak, around the Zoom, one last time. Uh, just a final encouragement uh, to folks. You know, you guys have heard the conversation. Um, we've, we've gotten to, to take a look at how this work looks in different sectors here locally and in, in history. Um, when it comes to this topic, or just in general in terms of life, what encouragements would you leave uh, to those that might be watching with us, uh, either live uh, or after the fact? And we'll, we'll start with Rick. This is the first time in, in our nation's history that we're able to kind of deal with uh, racism and inequality on a large scale. And we have a, a great opportunity in making the change for the lives of the underserved and underrepresented. Um, and basically, this gives us an opportunity uh, to align with the framework internationally and to, and, and to put, make it global and make it real for all of us as we're working forward and we have uh, the different people in place um, within our departments, within our commissions, within our organizations here in Pittsburgh uh, to be a leader, um, not just talking the talk, so to speak, but actually walking the walk and the city residents and our region benefit from the work that we've done so far. As you saw in the beginning slide, that it took us 
four or five years to get to this point. And now, now we're ready to implement the work behind it. And so that's where I'm excited um, because my two little girls and, you know, and their children will be able to benefit from the work that we're doing right now. That's wonderful. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Grant. Yeah, I would, I would just, you know, go back to kind of the prior question too, is, you know, I, I would really implore people to, you know, one kind of educate themselves about the SDGs and familiarize themselves uh, just with information on it, but also just within kind of, you know, the organization you work for, your employer, kind of ask yourself how the SDGs can make an impact in your organiza respective organization. Um, and I think what that does, going back to kind of the concepts of continuous improvement, um, you start to think about how the service or the product that you're working on delivering, um, how that affects other people's lives and how you can improve that service or product delivery. Um, and it, you know, it, it's one of those things about how you facilitate partnerships um, and really improve kind of the outcomes that, that you're driving for. So it, it's really something I think that everybody can um, take to their lives and how it can you know, improve kind of their, their community or the organizations that they're respectively working with. I appreciate that. Um, any final personal encouragements from, uh, from Grant Irvin? Well, since we have you on the call, man, uh, check, out, check out your TV show, something like that maybe? I wasn't gonna do any kind of promotion, you know, self-promotion or anything, but. Um, as we talked about, you know, we, we, we have our upcoming guest at the Grant Street Experience is going to be Mr. Rick Williams. And then Josiah, we're going to get you on there too, um, in order to do that, the, the continue the crossover episode. So we're it's, a, it's an ambitious crossover. I'd be, I'd be honored, sir. Uh, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about, I guess everyone's been thinking a lot about this, but you know, over the past few months, we've, we've learned a lot about what the harm of prior policies and programs and developments have really done to communities. Um, and I think that uh, a framework like this, where you're measuring against, you know, 17 different values um, and, you know, making sure that, you know, everyone, that, you know, there's a, a philosophy of inclusivity here. Um, I think that, you know, the SDGs and, and the more that align uh, their work with them and integrate the SDGs into, um, you know, city planning and, um, you know, any other policy making um, really has an opportunity to uh, make sure that we don't repeat any of those mistakes in the past where we've, you know, left people out or developed, uh, you know, without thinking about the harm, the irreparable harm that would be done to the environment or to our people, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, the SDGs have, have a really good opportunity um, to, to for people to demand better um, policy making and better governance and, you know, better, uh, you know, corporate social responsibility. Um, so I think, you know, educate yourselves on, on what this is and just demand better from, you know, all of our institutions, from your government, from your, your employer, et cetera. Thank you. I resonate with that. Demand better. And I think I would say, too, uh, know that better is here now. Um, and I think that this call exemplifies that in a lot of ways. This is not a new topic for the city of Pittsburgh. It's not a new topic internationally, um, but there is there has been some work that's been going on and a team in place right now in a way that I find very exciting. I hope that's encouraging to others. Uh, Kate, how about you? Uh, to just continue what or second what Rebecca said, uh, collaboration is really key. So the fact that the SDGs give us this common language for us to not only communicate with people outside of the city government or outside of Pittsburgh or the region, uh, but communicate with ourselves to better work for our residents. Uh, we can do better, we should do better, and this allows us to look introspectively and talk with ourselves and then also go and find the solutions that might exist in other cities. So. Yeah, something I, I truly believe is that everything is better when we, we collaborate and we talk and we, we try to work things out together as a team. And it definitely helps when everyone's speaking within the same framework. So the SDGs can give us that opportunity. Thank you so much. And Megan. Last but not least. Um, uh, last but not least. I think I, I agree with what everyone else says. And I just want to say... I know so many people are hurting right now and, and rightfully so, right? There are just huge issues that we as a society and as a city need to grapple with. Um, and I want people to know that we 
We are here for them. We are listening. Even if you don't know anything about the SDGs, but you want to tell us your story, I think that is so valuable. And that's something that we can't pull from any report or any data set. So hearing more from the people of Pittsburgh about how systems and government and the pandemic especially are affecting them is going to be so important to our future work. So whether it's attending a public meeting, reaching out privately, messaging us on social media, um, we're always here and we want to hear from you. Well, thank you each so much. Um, I've learned so much in this conversation and really enjoyed it. I encourage those that are watching, whether it's live or after the fact, uh, to consider reaching out to these folks individually, learning more about their work, engaging with them, uh, and their teams, their respective teams, and the kind of ecosystem, so to speak, of folks that are um, you know, active in this space. A lot to learn, a lot to get engaged with, a lot to be encouraged by, uh, and, and a lot to, to, to learn in terms of things that, you know, gaps, things that aren't so good, but where we're heading in a better direction. And I think uh, there's a chance for, for authenticity um, in the system uh, in a real way. There's no need during a global pandemic to run away from reality. It just is what it is, and, and it's about where we go from here. Um, so that's going to wrap us up on today's conversation. Thank you all so much for taking the time today uh, or wherever you may be or whenever you may be. Uh, we're going to continue this series next week um, on Monday at the same time, so Monday at noon. Uh, we'll be talking about the census, officials from the city, officials from uh, Allegheny County, the U.S. Census Bureau, and the Complete Counts Committee. Uh, so make sure you take a look at that. Really, really important work that's happening here uh, in the region, in the state, um, that will have a lot of practical benefit uh, and impact for uh, those of us that are living here today. So anyways, uh, in the meantime, please take the very best cares of yourself, very, very best care of yourself, and we'll see you next time. Great. Thanks.